45 Old Testament Dispensational Ages Inside of Time Dispensationalism is the rightly dividing of the word of truth. More completely stated, Dispensationalism uniquely expresses the unfolding of God's amazing grace by chronicling the various responsibilities given to man throughout the different ages, followed by man's failure to meet those demands, which calls for God's judgment, concluding in the dispensing of God's grace. Note, to a certain extent, the cycle found in the Book of Judges exhibits man's history with that history divided into its various dispensations. Technically, Dispensationalism has been explained as a theological system that emphasizes the grammatical, historical, literal interpretation of the Bible, it recognizes and emphasizes the distinction between Israel and the Church, and it organizes the Bible into different dispensations or administrations. The eight major dispensations, Ephesians 1, 10, or ages, Ephesians 3, 5, of man's time upon earth are as follows, 1. The Age of Innocence, Genesis 1, 1 Genesis 3, 7, prior to Adam's fall 2. The Age of Conscience, Genesis 3, 8 Genesis 8, 22, from the fall to Noah 3. The Age of Government, Genesis 9, 1 Genesis 11, 32, from Noah to Abraham 4. The Age of Patriarchs or Promise, Genesis 12, 1 Exodus 19, 25, from Abraham to Moses. 5. The Age of Law, Exodus 20, 1 Matthew 2 slash Luke 2, from Moses to John the Baptist 6a. The Age of Readiness Christ's Earthly Ministry, Matthew John, from the public introduction of Christ to his ascension the Age of the Church parenthetically inserted 7. The Age of the Church, Acts Revelation 4, 1 from Christ's ascension to the Church's rapture the resumption of the previous Age of Readiness 6b. The Age of Readiness Daniel's 70th week, Revelation 5-19, from the Church's rapture to the second advent of Christ 8. The Age of the Kingdom, Revelation 20, 420, 6, a literal, earthly 1000, year millennial kingdom following the second advent of Christ and preceding eternity future. Each one of these distinct periods involves a recognizable pattern of how God worked with those living in any particular age, 1, the stating of man's God, given responsibility, 2, man's failure to fulfill God's requirements, 3, God's judgment upon man's failure, and, 4, the dispensing of God's grace to continue. Throughout the span of man's existence, past, present, and future, God has dealt, does deal, and will deal with mankind in a variety of ways. The Bible gives us a clear record of these variations. As this book has already demonstrated, rightly dividing. Dividing the word of truth primarily means properly dividing the Bible into the various periods of God's dealings with man. These various periods can be referred to as the biblical dispensations, 1 Corinthians 9, 17, Ephesians 1, 10, Ephesians 3, 2, Colossians 1, 25, or Ages, Ephesians 2, 7, Ephesians 3, 5, 21, Colossians 1, 26, both of which are scriptural terminology. The chart below provides an overview of the Old Testament dispensations or ages. Although dispensational study frequently emphasizes the differences across various time periods, there are many constants throughout all ages of time. For example, while God changed in his actions with or message to mankind, I.E. God sent a flood to destroy the earth in Noah's day but promised he would never repeat that action again, he is eternally unchanging in his attributes, Malachi 3, 6, Hebrews 13, 8, James 1, 17. To accept and acknowledge God's changing actions or message in no way contradicts God's unchanging attributes. Fortunately for man, God's mercy and grace were not limited to the New Testament. Mercy involves God not giving what is deserved, grace is God giving what is not deserved. One can find references to God's grace and mercy throughout both the Old and New Testaments. For example, God's will is that mankind enjoy eternal fellowship with him having been saved from their sin in all ages, 1 Timothy 2, 4, 
2 Peter 3, 9. This salvation is ultimately only accomplished by having the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ applied on one's behalf. However, the blood had not been shed prior to the cross, thus the necessity of paradise, located in the heart of the earth, until after Christ's crucifixion. Compare the location of paradise in Luke 16, 26 and Luke 23, 43 prior to the resurrection and its location in 2 Corinthians 12, 4 following the resurrection. No one living prior to the cross was saved by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. At the same time, God did look forward to the cross, knowing about the future redemptive work of the cross from the very beginning. Revelation 13, 8 Men who believed God's progressive revelation involving that which was shown in their lifetimes were ushered into Abraham's bosom upon their deaths until the Lord Jesus Christ completed his work allowing them to be taken into heaven. Throughout man's sinful existence on earth, God repeatedly expressed his will to dispense mercy and grace to save man from the wages of sin. This expression can be found in each period. However, in each of these times, God's articulated plan had to be believed to accomplish his consistent will to save man. The Bible clearly reveals God's expectations for man. It also reveals that, for the most part, his commands and instructions get more detailed and more complex as history progressed from age to age. Perhaps this is God's way of showing mankind's sinful shortcomings. The further man gets from God, the more God must write down for man and the greater the detail he must use to hold man's attention. Whether the instructions are general or specific, simple or complex, mankind perpetually fails, dooming itself to eternal damnation. Damnation Despite man's failures, God's mercy and grace prevail in every age providing the means for an individual to have his sinful soul saved. Every age includes this basic set of components, God issues his commands either directly or more commonly through his spokesman or spokesman. By faith, man repents, believes, and obeys or else persists in unrepentance, disbelief, and disobedience. Thus, in every age, salvation comes by faith and is offered and granted through grace. The object of that faith changes according to what God commands man to believe and obey in any given period. With this in mind, repentance, belief, and obedience are more pronounced in some ages than they are in others. This will be evident as we study through the various ages. For example, in the age of the church, when a man believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he is saved as he repents of believing in anything else for salvation and obeys the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 While the heart of every man is deceitful and desperately wicked on its own, God looks on the heart of every person in search of repentance, belief, and obedience. 1 Samuel 16, 7, Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10. God redeems those who repent, believe, and obey. God judges those who fail to repent, believe, and obey. 1 Peter 4, 17. Several factors can hinder a person's understanding about dispensational truth. First, Man's finite mind has trouble differentiating the actions of God from his attributes. Another hindering factor is the tendency to view things in terms of definite start and stop times. Some dispensational ages do begin and slash or end with definite events at definite times, i.e. The church age ends at the rapture. However, in other cases, God extends the initial dispensing of his commands beyond a single particular event and time. A third hindrance to understanding dispensational truth is man's tendency to look to and long for what used to be. As such, man attempts to apply the commands of the preceding dispensational age to the current one. This phenomenon could be related to man's resistance to change along with his inclination to rebel against God's will. A fourth factor complicating man's understanding is the urge to play what if throughout the Bible. While this may make for interesting conversation, it does not result in profitable Bible study. Instead, one should stick to the facts of what did happen rather than playing what if over what did not occur. Some of the more common what if examples, what if Adam had not sinned? What if Noah did not build the ark? 
What if Rahab had not hidden the spies or put out the scarlet thread? What if the Jews did not offer the sacrifices? What if the Jews had accepted Christ as the Messiah? Despite all these hindrances, diligent dispensational study can overcome these problems and discover the truth. A survey of the different dispensational ages will again emphasize the necessity of rightly dividing the word of truth. Of course, the first dispensation is found in the first few chapters of Genesis. The Age of Innocence, Genesis 1-3, 1. The opening event the creation of man, at the time of his creation, man was innocent concerning good and evil. God placed the first man Adam into a perfect environment and gave him rule over the earth. He also gave Adam commandments of what to do in the garden. Genesis 1, 28 And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Genesis 2, 15 And the Lord God took the man, and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. 2. The necessity of faith in this state of innocence, man was to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and dress and keep the Garden of Eden. God gave only one commandment of what not to do. It concerned the tree designated by God as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Man had no need of the knowledge of good and evil, but God in his infinite wisdom allowed man to have the freedom to choose. In God's mind, True love could only be demonstrated by free will under a test. Genesis 2, 16 And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, 17 But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Up to this point, Adam and Eve only knew good. Their unbelief and subsequent sin brought about the outcome of the wages of sin, Romans 6, 23. They could have remained in a perpetual state of innocence pleasing God through a life of faith, Hebrews 11, 6. While far too many Bible teachers focus upon the obedience or the lack thereof, it should be noted that faith or faithlessness was the source that drove the visible actions. Adam and Eve's success or failure was riding solely upon faith and whether to trust in an omniscient God. 3. The absence of faith because of Adam and Eve's disbelief concerning God's warnings and the acceptance of the serpent's words, Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command. Thus, sin ended the age of innocence and doomed the race of man until a way of eternal redemption, Hebrews 9, 12, would be provided through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 3, 24. Adam and Eve's disobedience made them sinners. Genesis 3 6 And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. 7 And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and immediately became conscious of their sinful condition. It is at this point that the conscience of Adam and Eve was developed and began to do its work to accuse or excuse, Romans 2, 15. Their newfound conscience convicted them of their sin and they attempted to cover their sin, but to no avail. Man died not only spiritually but also brought God's judgment on his physical life, Genesis 3, 16 to 19. Adam and Eve traded spiritual life for spiritual death and traded a glorious covering for fig leaves and later skins of lambs. 4. Salvation in time, Adam and Eve repented of their disobedience and submitted to God's authority. Their outward acceptance of the garments of skin exhibited their inward faith to trust in God's provision. The point is clear. God provided a covering by killing an animal or animals thus compensating for Adam and Eve's sin that resulted in their nakedness. Their acceptance of the garments reflected their repentance and acceptance of the redemption provided, Psalm 130, 7. Yet, some Bible teachers choose to teach that Adam and Eve were saved by works with no scripture to support such a theory. If anything, 
Adam and Eve's salvation is quite to the contrary. This age ended with a requirement for God's grace and God's mercy. Salvation is always a work of God. Genesis 3, 21 Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins, and clothed them. 5. The closing event The fall of man God evicted Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, 22-24, thus making their physical death an eventual certainty and formally closing the age of innocence. The very first dispensational age unquestionably proves that innocence of evil and a perfect environment will not preclude man from his propensity to sin and disobey God. Innocence lost will not be completely regained until eternity future. While we cannot be dogmatic about the length of the age of innocence, we can use the birth of Cain, Abel, and Seth to set an approximate maximum amount of years. After all, Eve bore Cain, Genesis 4, 1, Abel, Genesis 4, 2, and Seth, Genesis 4, 25, after she and Adam were removed from the garden. Furthermore, Cain and Abel had enough time to be born and grow to the point of managing their own affairs and bringing their own sacrifices, Genesis 4, 3 to 4. Based upon the flow of the scripture text, it would seem as though Seth was born after Cain killed Abel, Genesis 4, 25, and we know that Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born, Genesis 5, 3. All this being considered, it is likely that the age of innocence lasted anywhere from a few days to a little over 100 years, the most likely being on the lesser end. Although Adam lived 930 years, Genesis 5, 5, he likely lived only a short time in a state of innocence. Because of sin, man now has a fallen, sinful nature and lives in a sin, cursed world far removed from the Garden of Eden. Man now lives, dies, and his body returns to dust. The internal knowledge of good and evil and man's expulsion from Eden brings us to the next dispensation known as the Age of Conscience. The Age of Conscience Genesis 4-8 1. The opening event expulsion from the garden sin changed Adam and Eve by bringing about the knowledge of good and evil thus awakening the conscience. The word conscience is a compound word made up of the root word science and the prefix con. The prefix con means with while the root word science means knowledge, 1 Corinthians 8, 7, 10. This conscience was to give man the knowledge of the existence of God. Romans 1, 19, in addition to the knowledge of what constituted good and evil, Romans 9, 1, Romans 2, 15. God designed a man's conscience as an internal tool to be exercised to place pure and righteous knowledge within an individual, such knowledge that he would otherwise lack. Man now lived in a fallen world, Genesis 3, 17, with the loss of innocence, Genesis 3, 22 with a sinful nature, Genesis 4, 1-10, John 6, 63, Romans 7, 18, Galatians 5, 17, with the loss of God's presence, Genesis 3, 24, Genesis 4, 16, and with the beginning of prayer, Genesis 4, 26. As such, man spoke to God through prayer, and God spoke to man through his conscience. Physical death first shows up in this dispensation, Genesis 4, 8, Genesis 5, 5, Romans 5, 12, 14. Mankind was now subject to the sorrow pronounced upon him by God in Genesis 3, 16-17. 2. Dispensational continuity The commission to replenish the earth remained in effect, Genesis 1, 27-28. For the woman, Sorrow in conception and subjection to her husband continued, Genesis 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 11, 8-9, 1 Timothy 2, 11-15. For the man, sorrow in his service, Genesis 3, 17, and sweat in his service, Genesis 3, 19, continued. Additionally, provisions were made for men to walk with God, Genesis 5, 24. Genesis 6, 9. One aspect of this walk included the offering of animal sacrifices, Genesis 3, 21, 
Genesis 4, 3-5 This was obviously a continuation from the example God established by offering an animal to clothe Adam and Eve and for restitution and continuation of fellowship. According to Hebrews, Abel knew that God required a blood sacrifice and by faith Abel offered, Hebrews 11, 4. Faith is only present when it is a response to the hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Men were to follow their consciences, Romans 2, 12-15, Acts 17, 30, and when men failed to do well, they were to offer sacrifices as a testimony of their acknowledgement. Acknowledgement of sin and repentance from that sin. Failure to do right was a clear indication of an evil heart. Genesis 4, 7a If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. 3. The necessity of faith as always, righteous deeds followed genuine internal faith. Man sees the righteous or unrighteous behavior first, but God first sees the faith or unbelief. When man acted upon his unbelief, God provided a means of restoration of fellowship. In the event of sin, God respected took note of and demonstrated acceptance by consuming it with fire the blood sacrifice of the sorrowful, repentant person. For instance, consider the case of Abel. Genesis 4, 4 and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. 4. The absence of faith God accepted Abel's blood sacrifice. Yet, there were others who refused to submit to the expectations of God and chose to do it their own way. Cain is a good example of this rebellious, humanistic, faithless philosophy in the early days of the age of conscience. God did not accept his faithless sacrifice because Cain knowingly and disobediently refused to bring the required blood sacrifice. Instead, he brought an offering of the fruit of the ground, demonstrating his own self, righteous religion, expecting God to adapt to his expectations, Romans 10, 3. Genesis 4, 3 And in process of time it came to pass, that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. God required an offering of a blood sacrifice in response to disobedient conduct. Any man who offered this sacrifice did so by faith. Cain's offering did not work any more than Adam. And Eve's fig leaves. God expected man to abide by his commands and would accept nothing less, Genesis 4, 5a. 5. Salvation Unlike the Age of Innocence, the Age of Conscience involved a much greater span of time and included a vast number of people rather than two. Approximately 1,600 years passed between the time the first couple was cast forth from the garden up until the time of the flood. In fact, it is a little. Known truth but Noah appeared on the scene only 126 years after Adam died. Thus, the lives of ADAM1 and NOAH2 basically spanned the first two millennia of human history the number of those living in the age of conscience grew dramatically partly because people lived so much longer. But also, families were so much larger, Genesis 5, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, 19, 22, 26, 30, with sons and daughters in addition to the ones specifically mentioned in scripture. Before long, there were many more men and women following the example of Cain and fewer after the likes of Abel. The masses possessed no faith and expected to be accepted by God upon their own terms. Inevitably, man's sin far exceeded his faith and his repentance in response to his sin. God's judgment would shortly come to pass. Genesis 6, 5 And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Despite the many years and multitude of people living at one time, there is not much information concerning God's dealings with man pertaining to the soul's salvation or eternal life. It is certainly safe to say that salvation was of God, after all. There would not even be an age of conscience were it not for the fact that the only two people living in the age of innocence failed to secure their own salvation. While the Old Testament account frequently focuses upon the deeds of men, 
the New Testament addresses the salvific aspects during this age that of faith. For instance, the New Testament tells us that Abel's sacrifice was done by faith and the sacrifice gave witness to the faith and resultant righteousness. Yet, some teachers unfortunately force their own preconceived teachings into the Bible to teach that Abel's sacrifice earned his salvation. They Bible says that Abel's sacrifice served as a witness or testimony. Abel offered his sacrifice by faith and his offering gave witness that he was righteous. Hebrews 11, 4 By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Enoch was translated by faith because he pleased God. The Bible then defines how Enoch and all others please God by faith. Faith pleases God. Hebrews 11, 5 By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. 6 But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Noah prepared an ark by faith and became the heir of the righteousness which is by faith. An heir is one who inherits the property of another in this case, Noah inherited God's righteousness and did so by faith. Hebrews 11, 7 By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. 1 Adam lived 930 years. 2 Noah lived 950 years with 350 years coming after the flood. 6. The closing event the flood man, in every dispensation, seems to want to live outside of the required faith of doing things God's way. The age of conscience was no exception. Therefore, God executed a universal, physical judgment upon mankind. Genesis 6, 7 And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Genesis 7, 2 3 A And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. Thankfully, God found one man of faith. That man inherited God's righteousness and found God's grace unmerited favor. Genesis 6, 8 This man and his family were ultimately used to spare mankind from extinction. His name was Noah, and his faith was on display for a perishing world in that he was a preacher of righteousness. 2 Peter 2, 5 Noah was a welcomed exception to the corruption and violence that had otherwise engulfed the world. Rather than being overcome by the wicked ways of his fellow man, Noah believed God's commandment for the age in which he lived, Genesis 6, 22, and naturally lived that which he believed. He taught his family to do the same. Despite the innately sinful hearts of these generations, God saw Noah's faith and graciously imparted righteousness. Genesis 6 8 But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 9 These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Genesis 7, 1 And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee. Have I seen righteous before me in this generation? Apart from Noah's family, no one accepted God's message through their conscience or through the witness of Noah. Their rejection of God brought about God's rejection of them. The flood, God's chosen method of judgment of unrepentant sinners, was worldwide. However, God provided redemption for Noah and his family through the building of an ark and thereby created a covenant with Noah and his family. Genesis 6, 18 But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou, and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. Genuine faith always yields action. Noah believed God's word and that faith was put on display for all to see through his obedience. Genesis 6, 22 Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he.
As in all ages, God ensured that man was without excuse. Romans 1, 20. God provided both an internal witness, the conscience, and a spokesman to preach his message of righteousness. In this case, it was Noah. 2 Peter 2, 5 And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, Noah warned the world through his preaching. He built and boarded the ark in faithful obedience to God's commandment but found both grace and righteousness ahead of this act of obedience. Again, demonstrating his faith, Noah remained on the ark until the moment God commanded him to go forth from the ark, Genesis 8, 15-16. Even in all the relief and excitement of stepping out onto dry ground, Noah wasted no time in continuing his faithful obedience and worship of God. He wanted to publicly worship the Lord for God's faithfulness during the flood and built a sacrificial altar to offer burnt sacrifices. Evidently, this pattern was first established by the Lord in the garden and passed down via word of mouth and through the conscience by Adam to his sons and beyond. Genesis 8, 20 And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. With the completion of Genesis chapter 8, God closed the age of conscience. Because of man's sinful nature and his rejection and corruption of his conscience, God changed his method of interaction and instituted governing rules of order. God would set forth the rules, but man would be responsible to enforce those rules. This period has come to be known as the age of government. The age of government, Genesis 9 to 11. 1. The opening event exiting the ark when the eight survivors of the worldwide flood stepped off the ark, they were given a series of commands by which to govern themselves. Some of these were new commands while others were restatements of existing commands. Hence, we have one of the greatest dangers of wrongly dividing the word of truth or neglecting to divide it altogether. Dispensationalism was never intended to suggest sharp distinct lines of starting and stopping of God's rules for governing. Oftentimes, God's mind in one dispensation continues into the next and even beyond. For example, God's commandment to Adam in Genesis 1, 28 to replenish the earth and to rule over it was repeated to Noah and to his sons, for obvious reasons. Genesis 9, 1 And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. 2 And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth. Upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. However, one of God's newly expressed commands to Noah concerned the modification of God's command to Adam where he had said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you Adam it shall be for meat. Genesis 1, 29. The animals walking off the ark with Noah would reproduce and become an added acceptable provision for meat, albeit with certain restrictions they were not to eat the blood. Genesis 9, 3 Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. 4 But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Another added dimension, and one that shaped the identification of this time as the age of government, was that man was to govern himself and the animal world by exercising judgment and justice. While we can see the seeds of this truth in the age of conscience with the statements concerning Cain, Genesis 4, 15, and later Lamech, Genesis 4, 23-24, the Lord now clearly stated that man was responsible to right the wrongs when innocent blood was shed. No longer was government simply an individual responsibility as given in the age of conscience, Genesis 4, 7. God no longer set a mark upon the murderer, Genesis 4, 15, but now required capital punishment at the hand of man. Genesis 9, 5 And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. 6 Whoso sheddeth man's blood, 
by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Henceforth, God exhorted man to order his own government upon the foundational concepts of judgment and justice, Proverbs 21, 3. There was to be judgment of actions and justice imposed for wrongdoings to establish and maintain order. God the Son will one day take this responsibility upon himself, Isaiah 9, 6-7, but until then, mankind bears the responsibility for administering true justice in this world. God's plan was for Noah to establish a godly order, to replenish the earth, and to wait for the promised deliverer. This age is best summarized as, God would not curse the earth again. Noah and family were to replenish, repopulate, the earth. Man was to have dominion over the animal creation. Man could add meat to his diet. The law of capital punishment was established. There would never be another worldwide flood. The rainbow served as the sign of God's covenant for succeeding generations. 2. Dispensational continuity Many of the truths that governed man prior to the flood continued after the waters assuaged. For obvious reasons, the commission to replenish the earth remained in effect, Genesis 1, 27-28, Genesis 9, 1. Also, the effects of the curse continued. For the woman, this meant continued sorrow in conception and subjection to her husband. For the man, this meant continued sorrow and sweat in his service. Spiritually speaking, provisions for men to walk with God continued, I.E. The conscience in addition to new commands, as did the offering of animal sacrifices for worship or in the repentant response for disobedience. 3. The necessity of faith just as it was in the creation, when the waters cleared from the flood, all the dry land was in one place and all the water surrounded the land. God had commanded Adam to replenish the earth and now he commanded Noah to do likewise. In other words, Noah and his family were to spread out and fill up the dry land of God's earth with the populace. This was the first commandment given on the post-flood world. As always, righteous deeds followed genuine internal faith, and disobedience followed unbelief. While we may see the righteous or unrighteous behavior, God first sees the faith or the faithlessness that precedes the actions. Fortunately, whenever man acted in unbelief, God still provided a means for the restoration of the severed fellowship. In the event of sin, God respected, took note of and demonstrated acceptance by consuming the sacrifice with fire, the blood sacrifice of the sorrowful, repentant person. Yet, this age focused upon man's personal and then societal failures with no mention of any sacrifices. 4. The absence of faith not long after the altar fires stopped burning, Genesis 8, 20-21, Noah and his family demonstrated their faithlessness by settling together rather than spreading out to replenish the earth. As the example of David in the case of Bathsheba, tragic things also happened in Noah's family when they were not where they were supposed to be. Noah became a husbandman, planted a vineyard, Genesis 9, 20, drank of the wine, and was drunken, Genesis 9, 21. As is often the case, drunkenness brought about nakedness. Ham, Noah's third son, saw his father's nakedness, Genesis 9, 21 to 23. When Noah awoke, he knew what his son had done unto him and pronounced a curse upon Canaan the son of Ham, Genesis 9, 24 to 25. Of course, as is man's nature, he wasted little time in resuming his sinful ways. He did this not only through individual sins but also through societal sins. The unbelief on the part of Noah and his family expanded as their family grew and multiplied. One of Ham's, Genesis 10, 6, 8, Descendants Nimrod, determined to establish an earthly kingdom, Genesis 10, 9-10, where mankind could stay together and make a name for themselves. Genesis 11, 4. Genesis 11, 4 And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. 
These sinful actions of rebellion simply expressed their unbelief. Unsurprisingly, their actions garnered God's attention, Genesis 11, 5-7. A people who were commanded to spread out and replenish the earth were now forced to do so. The Lord scattered them, Genesis 11, 8, by confounding their language, Genesis 11, 9. Genesis 11, 6 And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. 7 Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. 8. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. 9 Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Yet, the Bible hints that there was much more to the story. The Bible tells of one of Shem's descendants who was named Peleg in his days, likely at his birth, the earth was divided, Genesis 10, 25. While this could merely speak to the people going separate directions with their distinct languages, it more than likely referred to that which the scientists refer to as the continental drift. Genesis 10, 25 And unto Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Pelag, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Scientists often date the continental drift as having happened nearly 200 million years ago because they dismiss God and the worldwide flood. In reality, this event took place somewhere around 4,250 years ago, or approximately year 1,756 after Adam. Ultimately, the land split and the sons of Noah went their separate ways. The descendants of Japheth spread into Europe. The descendants of Shem located in Asia. The descendants of Ham migrated into Africa. Man has made such a mess of himself that only God can straighten him out first, by a new birth, but eventually with a new earth, Revelation 21, 1. Once again, man failed God's commands in the age of government. Therefore, God closed this age in Genesis chapter 11 and again changed his dealings with man. 5. Salvation The greatest demonstration of God's grace is often found in his judgment. When Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and declared the God of the Bible to ignorant and superstitious people, he referenced the judgment of Babel and described God's purpose for the judgment. Acts 17, 24 God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, 25 neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, 26 and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, 27 that they should seek the Lord. If haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. The sad truth is that the age of government from the call of Abram forward encompasses a 427, year period of man's unbelief and rebellion with not many good things recorded. God, who put truth in man's conscience and spoke truth into man's ear, only wanted man in return to believe him and obey his will. Man's unbelief caused him to congregate in an attempt to make a name for himself. So God, in his mercy and grace, split them up so that they would seek him, feel after him, and ultimately find him. 6. Closing event The call of Abram, or Abraham, the age of government likely lasted about 427 years. 3. Considering the number of years that passed, there is very little information upon which many doctrinal conclusions can be ascertained. We know there was failure on the part of Noah and his sons to spread out and replenish the earth. We know that their extended family failed to separate and even sought to develop a religion that magnified man, thus thwarting the will of God. We also know that Terah, Abram's father, was an idolatrous man who refused to serve the true and living God but loved and served other gods, Joshua 24, 2. 
It was from these ruinous conditions that God would call one man and begin a new age of his dealings with man. Three approximately 100 years transpired between exiting the Ark and the Tower of Babel and Earth's dividing. The time frame from the departure from the Ark to the birth of Terah, the father of Abram, was 222 years. The date of Abram's birth is quite contested. The common thought is that Terah was 70 years old when Abram was born, based on Genesis 11, 26. However, unless Abram, Neher, and Haran were triplets, the Bible must be referring to Terah's age when he began to have sons. To confirm this, Acts 7, 4 clearly says that Terah died before Abram left Haran for Canaan at which time Terah was 205 years old, Genesis 11, 32, and Abram was 75 years old, Genesis 12, 4. The difference of 130 years is the age at which Terah begot Abram. Adding the 222 years from the end of the flood to the birth of Terah and the 130 years to the birth of Abram and the 75 years till the call of Abram equates to 427 years for the age of government. The age of patriarchs slash promise, Genesis 12, Exodus 19. 1. The opening event the call of Abram or Abraham it has been estimated that a little over 4,000 years of human history transpired from Adam through Christ's incarnation. The time frame likely spans closer to 4,200 years. According to the Bible's chronology, from Adam to the call of Abraham extended over a 2,083 year period. Yet, throughout these two millennia, the scripture fails to point to one individual who performed enough good works to earn his own salvation or to boast of his personal righteousness. Adam failed to trust the Lord in the garden thus requiring God's mercy and grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and, by faith, became an heir of righteousness. This is true of Noah although he failed to trust the Lord shortly following his exiting the ark and disobeyed the Lord's direct commands. Two years after Noah died, Abram was born. Seventy, five years later, God called Abram and he departed from Ur of the Chaldees. While the Bible provides minimal information concerning the early days of Abram, we do know that he was born into and brought up in a world that had once again degenerated into an idolatrous mess. The Bible says that his ancestors served other gods, Joshua 24, 2. God once again, like in the days of Noah, sought for a man who had not corrupted himself with the generations of the fallen sons of God. God found such a man in Abram who willingly left behind his idolatrous roots to follow God. Genesis 12, 1 Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. The call of Abram signified several beginnings. Therefore, it is considered a new age called the age of patriarchs, fathers. Abraham became the first of what became known as the Jewish fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob see Acts 7, 32, making up the Jewish nation, Genesis 12, 2. He also became known as the father of faith, Romans 4, 16, and when he died, he was the first declared to be gathered to his people, Genesis 25, 8. The place of this gathering later took on Abram's name becoming known as Abraham's bosom, Luke 16, 22. Many of those who followed Abraham in death were said to be gathered unto their people or to the fathers, Genesis 35, 29, Judges 2, 10. This gathering took place until Shiloh came and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, Genesis 49, 10, Ephesians 4, 8. The call of Abram was threefold, Abram was to get out of his country, remove himself from his kindred, and separate from his father's house. He was to turn from idols and trust in the living God who would show him a land of promise. Genesis 12, 1 Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. Abram obediently heeded the first two of these conditions but failed to accomplish the third condition until Lot chose to separate and chose him all the plain of Jordan, and they separated themselves the one from the other, Genesis 13, 
11. After that Lot was separated from him, the Lord said unto Abram, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Genesis 13, 14 to 15. Not only did the Lord's call involve land, but it promised a blessed seed. The promised blessings were both to Abram and through him. To Abram, God promised to make of him a great nation and a great name. Through Abram, God promised to bless those who blessed Abram and curse those who cursed him. God further promised that in the Abram shall all families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12, 2 And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. 3 And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The New Testament points out that this promise was ultimately a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 8 And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. 9 So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Galatians 3, 16 Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. 2. Dispensational continuity There were many more similarities than differences moving from the age of government to the age of patriarchs. The age of government preceded God's identifying of a Jewish nation. Likewise, the beginning of the age of patriarchs continued God's dealings with a Gentile people. The people continued to rely upon their consciences in their dealings with the Lord, Romans 2, 12-15, and sacrifices were still a priority in the lives of those worshipping God and desiring to demonstrate heart repentance for disobedience. Since Moses would only later write the Pentateuch, we are not aware of any written word of God available to man. 3. The necessity of faith obviously, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob demonstrated their faith each time they built an altar to the Lord. Man's understanding concerning animal sacrifices was passed down from God to Adam to Noah to Abraham. Animal sacrifices remained an integral part of man's worship of God. In fact, the Bible records that Abram built an altar soon after his calling, Genesis 12, 7 and the last altar mentioned was built for his son Isaac, Genesis 22, 9. Isaac followed suit and built an altar calling on the name of the Lord, Genesis 26, 25. Likewise, Jacob worshipped God by building an altar as a part of his life and walk with God, Genesis 33, 20. More specifically, the Bible tells us that Abraham heard the gospel. With the fullness of understanding from the completed Bible, we know that this gospel message was not the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. In fact, the scripture clearly defines the specific gospel preached to Abraham as God saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed, Galatians 3, 8. Like every gospel preached in the scripture, it only profited a man if it was mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hebrews 4, 2 The gospel God preached to Abram involved his seed, and when Abram believed in the Lord, he the Lord counted it his belief to him Abram for righteousness. Genesis 15, 5 And he God brought him Abram forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them, and he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Romans 4, 1 What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? 2 For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. 3 For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. For now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth. The ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans 4, 
9 cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Romans 4, 16 Therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quick kenneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. 18 Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. 19 And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, twenty he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, twenty-one and being fully persuaded that, what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Twenty-two and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Genesis chapter 15 obviously marked a monumental moment in Abram's life. He was now a man with imputed righteousness because of his exercised faith. His faith was yet to be put to its ultimate test. In Genesis chapter 22, God tested Abraham's faith with a command that would cut to the core of any loving father's heart. Would Abraham obey God no matter the cost or the consequences? Genesis 22, 1 And it came to pass after these things, that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. 2 And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. With no recorded indication of hesitation or a faith that faltered, Abraham obeyed God. He passed the test by promptly obeying this extraordinary command until halted by God. Genesis 22 11 And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. 12 And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Some would consider God somehow unrighteous for asking such a thing of a father. How foolish to doubt the infinite wisdom of God, Psalm 147, 5. The tests of life are not for the benefit of an omniscient God, but so that man can learn who and what he really is. Abraham learned that there was nothing between him and his God not even that which he treasured most upon this earth. How did Abram pass this test? Men saw. Abraham's works, James 2, 21-24 but God saw Abraham's unwavering faith, Hebrews 11, 17-19. James 2, 21 Was not Abraham our father justified by works, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? 22 Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? 23 And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. 24 Yes see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Hebrews 11, 17 By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, 18 of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, 19 accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. Regardless of man's portrayal concerning the life of Abraham, true students of the Bible want truth to prevail. Abraham was counted righteous because of his faith in God's word with the initial promise made to him by God. Later, when called upon to offer Isaac, Abraham passed the test because he accounted that God was able to raise him Isaac up, even from the dead, Hebrews 11, 19. Regardless of a reader's perspective, Abraham prevailed by faith. After Abraham's willingness to offer Isaac, God confirmed his promise to Abraham. Genesis 22, 
15 And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, 16 And said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, 17 That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the sea shore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, 18 And in thy seed shall all the nations of thee. Earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Those who misunderstand the scripture generally consider the Genesis account with the account from James but fail to consider the implications in the light of the Hebrews account. Abraham believed God and his faith moved him to obey God. Some Bible students inclined to posing hypotheticals always ask what would have happened if Abraham did not, fill in the blank. The point is that each outcome is predicated upon the underlying faith and the works prove the existence and outworking of that unseen faith. If things did not turn out the way they did, it would mean that Abraham lacked faith. Others would further complicate the matter by stating that it was Abraham's faith coupled with his works that made Abraham righteous. However, it is the totality of scripture that offers the truest picture. The Genesis account should not be considered without the Hebrews account, nor should it be considered without the account found in the book of Romans, or James. In Romans chapter 4, God emphasized Abraham's simple faith stating emphatically that Abraham was not saved by works. Yet, there is more. Those with a preconceived agenda generally want their interpretation of the James account to trump all the narratives. Yet, James was dealing with a problem of professions of faith that yielded no change. To this, God used James to emphasize how Abraham's works in Genesis chapter 22 perfected, or completed, his faith expressed in Genesis chapter 15. Abraham's simple belief in what God had said was sufficient for God to impute righteousness, forgive his iniquities, and cover his sins. Abraham's heart was right with God, and God always looks at man's heart, 1 Samuel 16, 7. Ultimately, there is no doubt that Abraham was a man of faith and that the object of his faith was not the gospel which men must believe today to have God's imputed righteousness. While it is possible that the object of Abraham's faith and that which granted imputed righteousness was solely the promise of a seed, the book of Exodus offers another option meriting attention. Exodus 6, 2 And God spake unto Moses, and said unto him, I am the Lord, three and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. When expressing a transition from the age of patriarchs to the age of law, God told Moses that he was known by the fathers as God Almighty but would become known as Jehovah. This does not suggest that the name Jehovah, or Lord when translated, was never used or mentioned in ages past but that the fathers had come to know and believe on the Lord as God Almighty. What an intriguing thought. Did God really introduce himself to the fathers in a way that emphasized his power and might? Abraham, Genesis 17, 1 And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram, and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. Isaac. Genesis 28, 1 And Isaac called Jacob, and blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. To arise, go to Padan, Aram, to the house of Bethuel thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban thy mother's brother. 3 And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, Note, although this passage does not show God as introducing himself to Isaac with that name, it does demonstrate that he had done so in the past. Jacob, Genesis 35, 10 And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name, and he called his name Israel. 11 And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. God manifested himself to the Jewish fathers as the Almighty God. They needed to know that he was the God of the impossible, Matthew 19, 
26. Everything expected of the patriarchs by God demanded they possess this level of confidence. Those living at this time could not look back upon such a short history and believe that God could accomplish what he had promised to do, not unless they believed he was almighty. If they failed to believe that God was the almighty God, they would fail to live their lives in a way pleasing to him. In fact, struggle they did, often lying, deceiving, and manipulating to bring about with their carnal inventions what God had promised he would do. Although the Bible points to several individual victories accomplished by faith in the age of patriarchs, Hebrews 11, 8-27, it would seem the greater emphasis or the central point of faith was to believe that God was the Almighty. 4. The absence of faith man failed once again. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob often struggled in their walk of faith, but the faithlessness could not be any more evident than in the rejection of God's word as it was revealed to Joseph in his dreams. Eventually, his brothers sold Joseph into slavery because they disapproved of his dreams that showed that he would rule over them. Their rejection of Joseph expressed a rejection of the Almighty. After a series of trials and heartaches, Joseph was raised to prominence lasting through his lifetime. After his death, a new king of Egypt arose that did not know Joseph, Exodus 1, 8. The new pharaoh grew increasingly concerned with the number of the children of Israel and perceived a threat upon his people. As such, he enslaved the Israelites hoping to silence the perceived threat. Exodus 1, 11 Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for pharaoh treasure cities. Pithom and Ramses. 12 But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. 13 And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. 14 And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service, wherein they made them serve, was with rigor. Israel's hope grew dim and faith was hard to find. Pharaoh devised a plan to eradicate the Jewish race and charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, Exodus 1, 22. Yet, the more the Egyptians afflicted the children of Israel, the more they grew and multiplied. The burden of living under Egypt's bondage was hard, but the Lord did not forsake his people. Unfortunately, even after the exodus of Israel from Egyptian bondage, they lost faith and rebelled against the Almighty. They stopped crying out to God and instead murmured against his spokesman. Like all other ages, this one would end in abject failure. Exodus 15, 24 And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Exodus 16, 2 And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Their murmuring was in effect directly against God himself. Exodus 16, 7 And in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord, and what are we, that ye murmur against us? 8 And Moses said, This shall be, when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings which ye murmur against him, and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. It has been aptly stated that it took far less time and effort on God's part to get the children of Israel out of Egypt than it took to get Egypt out of the children of Israel. The redemption of Israel from Egypt ultimately required a singular event, but getting Egypt out of Israel required repeated testings, failings, and restorations. 5. Salvation Before we read of Israel's cry for help. Exodus 2, 23-24, provisions had already been made for their physical deliverance. Moses was born in a Levite's house, Exodus 2, 1, raised in the house of Pharaoh's daughter, Exodus 2, 10, and at age 40, his heart's desire was to deliver Israel from their Egyptian bondage, Exodus 2, 11-14, Acts 7, 23-28. Moses' abrupt departure dimmed the hopes of Israel, yet their cries continued to ascend to the throne of the Almighty. It appears that there was some level of decency showed Israel by the Pharaoh, but a new Pharaoh came to power, Exodus 2, 
23. Exodus 2, 23 And it came to pass in process of time, that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. 24 And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. 25 And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Forty years after Moses' departure from Egypt, God spoke to Moses and told him to return to Egypt, Exodus 3, 1-10. The promised deliverance was to be physical in nature, but it would require the Israelites to believe God's spokesman Moses. Although they had some misgivings about Moses and his message, Exodus 5, 21, Exodus 6, 9, Exodus 14, 11 to 12, they still cried out to God in faith, Exodus 14, 10. God miraculously redeemed Israel from Egypt's bondage and brought death and destruction upon the Egyptians. 6. Closing event The exodus from Egypt 215 years passed from the call of Abraham to Jacob's pilgrimage to Egypt. Jacob lived out the last 17 years of his life in Egypt with Joseph installed in the seat of power, Genesis 47, 28. Based upon the five years of famine left when Jacob came to Egypt, Genesis 45, 9-11, Joseph was approximately 30. Nine years old as his father arrived in Egypt, he was thirty when he pronounced the seven years of plenty followed by the seven years of famine Genesis 41, 46. After Jacob arrived in Egypt, Joseph lived another seventy, one years, Genesis 50, 26. At some point after Joseph died, year 2369 after Adam, there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph, Exodus 1, 8. Based upon the numbers set forth in Genesis 15, 13 and Exodus 12, 40 to 41, it would seem the 430 years began when Jacob arrived in Egypt, year 2298, and the affliction began 30 years later, 2328, 40, one years before Joseph's death. After Joseph's death, things progressively grew worse for Israel leaving little hope of physical deliverance from bondage. 270, nine years later, year 2648, Moses was born and 80 years later, year 2728, Moses would return to Egypt as the one who would lead them out. These times equate to the age of patriarchs spanning 645 years. Through a series of events, Israel was finally brought to the foot of Mount Sinai to receive God's law. On the west side of the Red Sea, they witnessed the ten plagues against the gods of the Egyptians. In the midst of the Red Sea, Israel crossed on dry land, and once safely standing upon the eastern shore, they looked upon the Egyptians as they died. Between the Red Sea and Mount Sinai, Israel endured bitter waters at Merah, Exodus 15, 22 to 25, hunger. Exodus 16, 1-19, and Rebellion, Exodus 16, 20, in the wilderness of sin, and thirst, Exodus 17, 1-7, and war, Exodus 17, 8-16, in Rephidim. The Age of Law, Exodus 20, Matthew 2-Luke 2. 1. The opening event the giving of the law approximately 4,000 yars 4 of human history transpired from Adam up to the birth of Christ or 4,200 depending upon dates used. According to historians, a little over 2,500 years passed prior to the giving of the law. Our studies lead us to believe that number is closer to 2,700 years. 5 As one considers the 400 year period of silence six prior to Christ's incarnation, approximately 1,100 years of recorded history remains. During that period, with spaces of time involving unique situations and conditions, the nation of Israel was under the law. 7. God spelled out his commands under the law in detail. He also expressed a variety of punitive and corrective actions to be taken when the law was violated. In his mercy and grace, 
God also provided an elaborate system of sacrifices and offerings to affirm and renew lost fellowship. Both individually and collectively, God provided a means for atonement, Exodus 29, 33-37, and forgiveness, Leviticus 4, 20, 26, 31, 35, Leviticus 5, 6, 10, 13, 16, 18, Leviticus 6, 7, in the temporary purifying of the flesh, Hebrews 9, 13. 4 according to Usher 55 2728 to be exact. 6 indicating no new revelation from God 7 note, an argument could be made that this age should be divided into the law and the prophets, Luke 16, 16. 2. Dispensational continuity Dispensational teachers have frequently assumed that the arrival of a new dispensation eliminated how God and man interacted in previous dispensations. Yet, it might be more accurate to view the Old Testament ages following the Age of Innocence, with minor exceptions, as one age stacked upon another rather than each age replacing or negating the structure of the previous ages. For instance, Man's conscience came into use after the age of innocence and will continue throughout time until man receives his glorified body no longer in need of a conscience. Additionally, several of the truths set forth in the age of government were confirmed and strengthened in the age of law. One area of continuity specifically addressed in Paul's epistle to Galatia concerns the law and the promises to Abraham. Galatians 3, 17 And this I say, that the covenant, that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make. The promise of none effect. 18 For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. 19 Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. The law was not intended to completely displace the age of promise, also known as the age of patriarchs. With the arrival of the law, God's promises were not discounted or voided. Instead, the law was intended to serve a temporary purpose till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Man's ability to know God was not given through the law but rather through the conscience and through the revelation of God's word and faith in that word. 3. The necessity of faith Those with preconceived concepts often confuse their concept of God's purpose and plan for the law. The law was the nation of Israel's constitution. As such, it was the way Israel was to be governed in the land under God. One major difference between Israel's constitution and that governing the other nations concerns the God, ordained church, religion, and state combination under the law for Israel. Unlike the state, religion of Israel, God graciously allows man today the freedom to worship God according to his conscience without governmental interference and mandate. As such, the law was intended to guide man's conduct so that God could dwell in the midst of his people in the land. The law was never designed by God to save anybody nor to make the doers safe in eternity, Galatians 2, 16, Galatians 3, 21, Hebrews 7, 19. Instead, God articulated the law to demonstrate the sinfulness of man, Galatians 3, 19, 1 Timothy 1, 9. As such, the law served as a schoolmaster to bring man to a point of recognizing his sinful condition and his inability to overcome this condition through his own merits, Galatians 3, 24. Like all other preceding ages, faith played an important function in the age of law. With the Jewish fathers, God revealed himself as the Almighty. He expected them to believe on him as such. However, when speaking to Moses, God introduced himself by saying, I am the Lord and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them, Exodus 6, 2-3. 8 Those who have their primary focus upon the works of the law have missed the repetitious emphasis God intended to convey. For instance, 
The phrase I am the Lord is found 159 times in scripture with the vast majority, 157 times, occurring between Exodus 6, 2 and Malachi 3, 6. Additionally, I the Lord occurs another 50, 3 times with every reference occurring from Moses to Ezekiel. Furthermore, 6,414 of the 6,580 uses of Lord, Yehovah, and 307 of the 310 uses of God, Yehovah, are found from Moses to Malachi. Under the law, Israel was to believe on the Lord as Jehovah. Jehovah is the unique name of God. Other names, like God and Lord, may be used at times of other beings, 1 Corinthians 8, 5, but Jehovah refers exclusively to the God of the Bible, Psalm 83, 18. As Jehovah, he is the self, sufficient God, the source of his own existence. He is independent of all creation and would exist even if nothing else in the universe existed. This is the reason he revealed himself to Moses as the Great I Am, Exodus 3, 13-15, when he said, I am that I am. Although Israel was given works to maintain proper fellowship with God, they needed to believe on the God who was self, sufficient and was in need of absolutely nothing that they had to offer. In fact, two important truths must be grasped concerning this age, God did what he did that men might know that I am the Lord, Exodus 6, 7. Israel was to do what God commanded under the law as an acknowledgement of their faith in God as the Lord. For example, Leviticus 11, 44 For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy, neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Leviticus 11, 45 For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt, to be your God, ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 18, For ye shall do my judgments, and keep mine ordinances, to walk therein, I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 18, 5 Ye shall therefore keep my statutes, and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, I am the Lord. Leviticus 18, 6 None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him, to uncover their nakedness, I am the Lord. Leviticus 18, 21 And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Leviticus 18, 30 Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs, which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein, I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19, 3 Ye shall fear every man his mother, and his father, and keep my Sabbaths, I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19, 10 And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard, thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger, I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19, 12 And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 14 Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God, I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 16 Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor, I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 18 Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 28 Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you, I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 30 Ye shall keep my Sabbaths, and reverence my sanctuary, I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 31 Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards, to be defiled by them, I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19, 32 Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God, I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 34 But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt, 
I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19, 37 Therefore shall ye observe all my statutes, and all my judgments, and do them, I am the Lord. Leviticus 20, 7 Sanctify yourselves therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20, 8 And ye shall keep my statutes, and do them, I am the Lord which sanctify you. Leviticus 21, 12 Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God, for the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him, I am the Lord. Leviticus 22, 2 Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they profane not my holy name in those things which they hallow unto me, I am the Lord. Leviticus 22, 8 That which dieth of itself, or is torn with beasts, he shall not eat to defile himself therewith, I am the Lord. Leviticus 22, 31 Therefore shall ye keep my commandments, and do them, I am the Lord. Leviticus 22, 32 Neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel, I am the Lord which hallow you. Leviticus 23, 22 And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest, thou shalt leave them unto the poor, and to the stranger, I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 24, 22 Ye shall have one manner of law, as well for the stranger, as for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 25, 17 Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 26, 1 Ye shall make you no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land, to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 26, 2 Ye shall keep my Sabbaths, and reverence my sanctuary, I am the Lord. This sampling should convey God's intended truth. Israel was to believe on God as the Lord, Jehovah, and based upon that faith, they were to do His will. Failure to do what God said demonstrated a lack of faith in Jehovah. 8. Additionally, the Bible uses all, caps Lord or God to serve as the translation of the Hebrew name Jehovah, Yehovah. For example, and Abram said, Lord, Yehovah, God, Yehovah, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Genesis 15, 2. God in this case refers to Jehovah. 4. The absence of faith sadly, the Israelites forgot the source of their spiritual life, their hope, and their blessings. History reveals that when man fails to reverence God in the proper manner, man turns to idolatry. Eventually, Israel put their faith in their works rather than in the God who was to be the object of their love and devotion. Christ's day was indicative of the nation of Israel, the scribes and Pharisees were meticulous in keeping the letter of the law but neglected the spirit of it, Matthew 23, 23. Rather than having a broken and contrite heart, they took pride in their piety, Matthew 23, 1-6. Unfortunately, the Jews lost sight of the import of faith and assumed righteousness and justification was found by works. This mishap cost the Jews dearly. Romans 9, 30 What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. 31 But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. 32 Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, Israel's 1100, year recorded history of behavior while under the law demonstrates their faithlessness. Israel's failure was apparent in two ways, one, they either rejected the law altogether, Jeremiah 6, 19, Hosea 4, 6, or, 2, they kept the outward form of the law without the heart, Isaiah 1, 11 to 15, Isaiah 58, 1 to 7, Amos 5, 21 to 27, 
Micah 6, 7-8 Their lack of fellowship with God was demonstrated most visibly in their rejection of their Messiah, John 1, 11, Acts 2, 22-23, Acts 3, 13-15, Acts 7, 52 Israel's disobedience, which stemmed from faithlessness, led to their ruin. Their demise was gradual with continual opportunities for repentance and restoration. In the book of Judges alone, Israel served Chushan, Rishay them eight years, Judges 3, 8, and Eglon the king of Moab eighteen years, Judges 3, 14, was oppressed by Jabin and Sisera of Canaan for twenty years, Judges 4, 1-3, was delivered into the hand of Midian for seven years, Judges 6, 1, was sold to and vexed by the Philistines eighteen years, Judges 10, 7-8 and again for forty years, Judges 13, 1. Later, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken into the Assyrian captivity, 2 Kings 17, 22-23, and the southern kingdom of Judah was taken into Babylonian captivity, 2 Kings 25, 1-3. This history reflects God's judgment upon a faithless people. 5. Salvation even with Israel's repugnant history, there are those who teach that the Israelites' salvation was based upon obedience to the law. With this in mind, simply consider a few of the problems associated to specific times when the Jews could not keep the law. How were Israelites saved when they had no place of worship to offer their necessary sacrifices? Israel surely had difficulty keeping the law a good portion of the 111 years they were under the rule of others during the days of the judges delineated earlier. What about the hindrances involved in keeping the law during the years spent in Babylonian captivity outside the land? What about the times when the Jews were in their homeland but with a destroyed temple? If Israel's eternal redemption required adherence to the law, not a single Israelite was saved outside the borders of Israel. This includes those in captivity and those who traveled to other lands not to mention those who lived in Israel but were under the rule of others who would not permit the necessary sacrifices. Even those who had no such hindrances still faced obstacles. The law provided man two ways to approach God through his own works. 1. Initial obedience to the commandments, Exodus 24, 1-8, Leviticus 18, 5, Deuteronomy 27, 26, and 2. The making of sacrifices, Leviticus 1, 1-4, Leviticus 4, 27-35. Obviously, obedience to the commandments could not save man because no man could keep all the commandments, Ecclesiastes 7, 20, Romans 3, 12 to 14, 19 to 20, Romans 8, 3, Galatians 2, 16, Galatians 3, 10 to 12, 21 to 22, Hebrews 7, 18 to 19. The making of sacrifices could not save man because the blood of animals could not put away sin, Psalm 51, 16, Isaiah 1, 11, Hosea 6, 6, Hebrews 9, 8-10, Hebrews 10, 11, 14. This is the ultimate conundrum. Conundrum for those who teach that keeping the law could afford someone life. 6. Closing event the life of John the Baptist basically, the age of law began at Moses and ended at the forerunner of Jesus Christ John the Baptist, Matthew 11, 13, Luke 16, 16. Matthew 11, 13 for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Luke 16, 16 the law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man press saith into it. In other words, the end of the age of law is basically the beginning of the New Testament. Those who choose to dispute this assertion would disagree with the Bible's accuracy in being divided between Malachi and Matthew as the Old Testament and the New Testament. Most balk at this since the Bible says that a testament is of force after men are dead and that it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth, Hebrews 9, 17. Yet, it is also true that every Testament is drafted during the testator's life or there is no testament to be of force when the testator dies. 
The New Testament begins with the drafting of the Testament that does not go into force until after the death of Christ. We agree that there is an Old and New Testament correctly placed between Malachi and Matthew. Those who criticize the division of the Testaments in the Bible should realize the dangerous precedent being set for the Bible critics. Calling these things into question with no scriptural justification tends to exalt the individual's opinion above the Word of God. Additionally, it places doubts within the minds of unbelievers as to the Bible's validity. The reality is that the New Testament began with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, gained its value in his life, and became a force at his death. Although Jesus Christ did not come to abolish the law, the age of law obviously gave way to a renewed age with the life of Christ. This is fitting since the law served as the schoolmaster to bring men to Christ. The law itself pointed to Christ both in doctrine and in typology. Sadly, the misunderstanding and misappropriation of the law left men shackled in darkness. Darkness and that is exactly how they were when the light of the world adorned himself in a body of flesh. Hebrews 9, 16 For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. 17 For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth.